Hello and welcome to another episode of The Mark Moss Show, where we're always talking about the decentralized revolution, how the world is changing right before our very eyes as we look at it through the lens of politics, finance, and technology. Of course, that technology is always Bitcoin, the decentralized technology that's changing the world. And you know, I like to bring to you some interesting guest. You don't have to listen to me talk all the time. And that's what I have for you today. I'm sitting down with Morgan Richard. She is a financial planner. Yes, old school legacy uh, financial planner. She's worked with Origin Wealth Advisors. She's the host of the Bitcoin for Advisors podcast. She's the second half of Pierre Richard, who we had on just recently as well. Uh, but Morgan, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Mark. Uh, Man, uh, we always get, get into so many good conversations before we start recording, so let's go ahead and just jump right into it. But um, before we jump into the deep end of the pool, sort of where we were before, let's maybe start just like a little bit uh, higher up and think about for a minute, you know, being a financial planner, uh, financial advisor. Why do people need to have a personalized financial plan? Yeah, it's a great question. So. I think most people don't really want to think too much about their finances because we want to do more important things with our life, right? Like we want to have families, we want to be part of our community, we want to have a place in the world. We want to think about things creatively and, you know, expand ourselves spiritually. And if you think about that, finances aren't really on that long list of what's important to people, but finances weave its way into every single one of those categories. And whether that's because money is just, it's a source of value, right? And that we're able to put value on certain things and pay for that. And it's uh, proof of work in a way, right? Where people, they charge whatever it is that they're going to charge for a good or service that somebody else would value. Um, or it's just that we really do live in this financialized world as a result of, you know, decades and decades of um, continued financialization of things. I think it's a combination of the two for sure. And that because of that, um, taking a deep look at your finances, where you want to go, where you are now, and where you would like to be, um, and where you've been in, really in the past, is going to help make informed decisions in the future that will lead you down a responsible path. Yeah. I find it odd. Um, I, I agree with everything you said, but I do find it sort of odd that like people will spend so much time making money. So, uh, you know, school, obviously, continued education, you know, university, a lot of money and time in continued uh, university education. Um, and then, you know, they're going to spend all this time in their job. They're going to, you know, potentially try to, um, you know, climb up sort of that corporate ladder, make more money. They're working overtime. I mean, they put so much effort into making money. And then once the money's made, they just like eh, forget about it kind of a thing. Um, seems kind of weird. Yeah, um, but absolutely. I guess. Yeah, and I guess a lot of it, though, is then giving it to somebody else. Well, right? in a way, right, there are a lot of things that people can do themselves to help set themselves up to be in a better place. So the first thing, right, is you spend all of this time, like you were saying, making the money. And then the second thing is making sure that you're saving properly. And so for most people, that's going to be at least 20% of their pre-tax income. Um, it obviously depends on where you've started, like what you've started at, right? If you inherited money, then maybe you can save less than that. Um, if you have a negative net worth, right, because you spend a lot of money getting student loan debt and so forth, then yeah, you're going to want to maybe save more than that 20% number. But on average, 20% of pre-tax income is where people need to start. I think where it gets kind of hairy is that 20% of pre-tax income is actually really difficult to do, especially in an inflationary environment. And so what happens is that people, they get on some sort of spending track and then they increase spend expenses as their income goes up because, you know, oh, I'm working so hard. I, I deserve it. I can have these things or, um, oh, my kid needs this or my spouse needs that or we have to, you know, do whatever X, Y, Z thing that somebody comes up with to do. And then from there, it's kind of like how the government, they'll increase expenditures, but they never really cut anything back. And so things get seemingly get added, but things don't get taken away. And so in life, everything is trade-offs, right? So when people do that in their personal finance, is, what happens is that they just generally save less or they accumulate debt, um, but they don't really stop to think about what's going on. And so I think if people were able to just sit back and really look just kind of at basic finances, like of what's coming in, what's going out, many, many people would be in a much better situation. Yeah, I, I think of money sort of like time. Time is money, right? Money is time. But you think about like uh, time and money are sort of the same in a sense. Well, lots of senses. But um, I can either at the end of the month wonder where the heck did all my money go or where did all my time go? Or we can plan in advance where we want our time or where we want to, we want to spend our time and money. Um, and to your point, yeah, most people just completely avoid that. I, I want to just hit, hit one more point real quick on this. So 
You, you talked about personalized financial advising. So most people though are probably just going through their work plan. So their 401k, mutual fund, whatever, right? So they're like pulling out of their paycheck and someone else is sort of administering that without really taking into account their personal situation. Is that sort of what you think the, the traditional path of most people is sort of like, let's let my plan administrator. And then is there a big difference into getting a personalized plan? Yeah, definitely. So a personalized plan is going to be working with somebody who understands you, your family, your specific situation has actually spent time not only listening to what your goals are, but actually helping you come up with them. A lot of the times what happens is that people just say, okay, well, you know, I want to retire and I want to send my kids to school, but I haven't really thought about much else. Um, and so a good financial planner is actually going to sit there and go through what, what is going to make life be most fulfilling for somebody. And, um, what is most fulfilling for not only that person, but also for the whole family, and then organizing the plan around that. And so that's going to mean um, tailoring the person's specific um, savings rate. It's going to mean picking specifically how the person is saving versus investing or like what it, their asset allocation itself looks like. It's going to involve um, estate planning of some kind because they're going to eventually either pass wealth or we want to make sure that even if they don't want to pass wealth, that they're provided for in some way during their life right and that the that it should something arise something like where they were to become incapacitated or so forth that they would have the documents in place that were necessary to make sure that somebody who loves them can take care of them right so basic things like this um where people don't necessarily think about it when they're like all right well i get my 401k match and you know i spend money on blah 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 thing and then i'm just that's the way I do it. And so I think a lot of the times there's just other aspects to a financial plan that a financial planner in and of itself will just help bring to light. And then a good fi financial planner will help be collaborative in that process because the financial planner, obviously, like we don't know the specific intricate details of somebody's life. We can only give the information based on the information that we receive. And so right. um, what I generally recommend is that anyone is going to work with a planner, that they make sure that, that person is really listening to them and that um, that they're working together on the plan rather than the advisor just throwing a, you know, a stack of papers across the desk and say, do this. Great. I love that. Um, it's, it's like a coach, like it's somebody to kind of give you this outside perspective and help you think through things and, and make sure you're checking all the boxes, which is super important. So, um, now let's dig in a little bit. So uh, before we were recording, you were telling me that you're one of seven, <laughs> one of seven uh, financial advisors that are Bitcoin financial advisors. Uh, I don't think there's any official designation for that. I guess you're somewhat self-designating yourself as a Bitcoin financial advisor. Um, how has that worked um, for the last seven years? And so just uh, at the time of this recording, the Bitcoin ETF just got approved and this changes everything. But let's talk about pre what happened this last couple of days. How has it been being a Bitcoin financial advisor when most people maybe aren't able to buy Bitcoin in a traditional you know, method? Yeah, so it's a it's basically uncharted territory. Um, it's applying the current like it's basically applying the legacy system to what I believe is going to be the new system, using the rules and the regulations as they are today to help make informed decisions about how people can save money, transfer their wealth, and live in the future when I do believe that Bitcoin will be used as a currency, not just, um, you know, the store value. I think it'll be, you know, the store value, the medium of exchange, the unit of account, the whole thing. And so I don't obviously know how long that that's going to take. And so we need to work in the reality in which we live. And the reality that we live right now, right, is more fiat than it is Bitcoin, in which case we need to apply the fiat rules to Bitcoin and make it such that people can pass this and use it in the way that is within the legal framework of what's available. Bitcoiners don't like to hear that, I think, from me because they want to, you know, just say, okay, the IRS is gone, like none of this stuff matters. And maybe they're right, right? Maybe in the future, there's no more IRS, there's no more government, you know, we live in some libertarian utopian society. And like, you know, I hope that some of these people get their wish and that would be great, right? But given the fact that we don't, we're not living in that society, right? We still need to yeah. plan around these things. And so there yeah. aren't really like these, Let you know, the rules of thumb. Um, some people think about this utopian state that maybe one day we'll get there, but I agree with what you were saying. And I often say that we have to sort of invest in the world as it is, not as we want it to be or as we think it'll be, but as it is today. So um, I agree with that point for sure. Let's talk about um, <laughs> a question I get asked all the time, and I'm sure you get asked all the time. Um, how much Bitcoin should I buy? Uh, and, and specifically, like what type of allocation should I buy? 
and I'm sure the answer depends. <laughs> um, so maybe you could talk about how you would answer that question for different people. Maybe you say, hey, if you're younger, higher income, older, less income, or I don't know, how would you answer that question, I should say? Yeah, absolutely. I get asked this question all the time, and I think there's variations on this question too, but why don't we stick with the allocation one? That way we can sort of keep it simple. So um, I would say that all of this is going to depend on risk tolerance, which breaks down to ability to take risk and also willingness to take risk. Ability to take risk is less often looked at. Ability is like how often you are paid, how um, how likely it is that you're actually going to receive that income, um, how much money you actually have as far as net worth is concerned, right? Somebody who has $2 billion can take more risk than somebody who has $2,000, right? So things like that play into a lip ability. People often think of willingness, you know, it's like, do you bungee jump or not, right? They think of that when they think of yeah. risk tolerance. And so generally people say, oh, people who are into Bitcoin have high, high risk tolerances because they're willing to stomach that kind of volatility. And that certainly plays into it, but ability as well. Um, and then it's going to be how well you understand the technology. So are you new at this and you're not really sure whether or not like Bitcoin is going to become a thing? Um, you know, you're probably going to take a lower percentage relative to somebody who has, you know, this is everything that they do. They live, breathe and sleep and eat Bitcoin. Right. And so that's going to like their understanding, the amount of hours that they've spent trying to learn about the technology is going to look very different than somebody who's maybe read a few articles on Forbes. And so um, I think that that all plays into allocation. But that said, um, I generally tell people that if they want to be 100 percent in Bitcoin, that that. I don't disagree. We don't advocate that people be 100% in Bitcoin um, because generally what I've found is that in my practice, people have other goals that are shorter term than what Bitcoin allows for, in which case you need to have fiat mm, to point. basically subsidize that. Um, but that if you have a decent emergency fund, if you have somewhere between three and six months worth of expenses saved in fiat, that if you want to be 100% in Bitcoin and you've got a high risk tolerance, both willingness and ability, and you also have um, very good understanding of the technology, then that's fine by me. Bitcoin is a savings technology. It's not investment, in which case we don't tell people how much savings they're supposed to have, right? I mean, we can guide them and give them guidelines on how much they should accumulate based on their goals, but we don't tell them from a percentage standpoint whether or not it's a like you should be 100% in savings or you should be 95% in savings. That's going to be more dictated by somebody's overall financial picture and whether or not having risk on investments um, make more sense relative to their picture. That said, I'm not a 100% allocator generally, and so I'll give people kind of more buckets. So if you're young and starting out and you really know the technology and so forth, you're 100%. Most people in my practice actually generally fall in this 40 to 50% range where you know they're on board, they understand the technology really, really well. Um, they are using this as a long-term savings vehicle. They think that this is going to be their best bet to hedge against inflation. Um, they believe that this is going to be money that they use in the future. That said, they have enough short-term goals that it makes the most sense for them to hold somewhere between you know 50 to 60 percent of their net worth in fiat-related assets. Um, generally, what we found is like that kind of is the real sweet spot for people who are really have a good understanding of the technology, but like aren't just you know Bitcoin's not everything in their life. Um, and then for everybody else, it's really kind of somewhere between three and 10%. I actually used to fall in this 1% camp of like, just get off zero, have 1%. Um, I don't actually think 1% is enough. I think that starting positions actually should be larger, um, provided obviously that somebody is willing to take that risk. Um, but because I just don't think that 1% of somebody's net worth is going to be enough to hedge against all the other risks out there of not holding Bitcoin, in which case um, 3%, while it's not, you know, a fail safe, it's definitely going to help more than 1%. Yeah, well, I, I, that, was a, that was a really good breakdown. I would agree with uh, a lot of that. I think as far as the 100% allocation, I am, I, I'm opposed to that. Uh, and, but, but, but I'll say that with a caveat, and that is that I think that the more assets you get, the more you want to diversify that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, obviously, Warren Buffett talks about you know, concentration for growth and diversification for protection, um, but I learned the hard way in 2008 after selling two businesses, after uh, building tons of real estate, um, and I was all in on Southern California real estate, and that turned out very horribly for me. <laughs> so my PTSD, I'm like never all in, and I, I get like the the smaller allocators, the plebs, the younger people, if you will. You got a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks, like you're all in. You got five million or ten million, like you probably want to buy some other things, <laughs> right? So I think it yeah. it sort of depends on that as well. I totally agree, and I think that's also why. I mean, we generally deal with a higher net worth population, and why people generally fall in these forty to fifty percent allocation range. 
syringes is exactly because of that. Yeah. So I think a lot of the noise that I hear online, of, oh, 100 percent go in <laughs> or the, the sell your chairs movement. Um, you know, yeah, if you got two thousand bucks, like go all in. What do you got to lose kind of a thing? Right. But um, Michael Saylor, as bullish he is, uh, I've been to his house. He's got really big houses and he's got really big boats and he's got businesses. Right. So he has other things like that. Um, I also liked what you said about the time frame. Right. So I think uh, that's another big piece. Right. So. Bitcoin typically sort of runs in these cycles and maybe there hasn't been a period of more than about three years where the price has been down. And I, as I said, sort of came from this real estate sector and it was sort of like uh, time, five year time frames. You would typically think about that cycle. So then would you typically tell some of your clients like, hey, only put money into Bitcoin that you could allow to sit there for at least three, four or five years? Do you we give generally them sort of go longer than that. Okay. Um, my feeling is that these cycles may you know they may or may not be related to the having um every time they have been related to the having and therefore like yeah we can kind of look at past performance and maybe predict future performance but maybe we can't right in which case it's probably better to err on the side of like not needing this money for more like eight to ten to fifteen years um generally if somebody doesn't it, I, I'm really more looking at a 10 year time frame for people to be holding things. Um, in general, that's kind of how I look at risk ask assets in general. So st whether it be stock market, real estate, anything like that, where especially real estate where you're going to have um, intense costs, right, to sell and so forth. Um, you want to be holding these for longer time periods so that it makes sense. And same thing with Bitcoin. It's like we are here for the long term. If you need something over the shorter period of time that we are planning for, we're not using Bitcoin to plan for it. Um, Bitcoin to me is like, especially well for younger crowds, right, it would be a retirement asset. For older crowds, it would be a portion of retirement assets because they have generally long periods of time where you're actually in retirement. Most people have a 30 year retirement period, let's call it. And then also legacy planning, right? Bitcoin would be a great tool for that. There are other um, longer periods of time, like let's say you have student loan debt or something like this, and you're in one of these income-based repayment programs. These are 20, 30 year periods of time, right? Where you could use Bitcoin as a savings vehicle to help hedge against a tax bill or so forth for any of these kinds of things. So it's just kind of looking at the time period and making sure that it's long enough to be able to withstand cycles. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think about some of these traditional vehicles to, to invest through like an IRA or a 401k where you, your, your money is basically locked up in there anyway, that you have penalties if you get it out. So if you think about it in those terms, like, hey, I'm locking it up, I don't get it for later. I think you'll probably be better off. Obviously, the long term perspective, we'll get into that. Morgan, let's talk about the big news here, the, the ETF, the Bitcoin ETF finally uh, came through, um, you know, it's been in the works for years at this point. It seemed like Bitcoin, or I'm sorry, Wall Street was always gonna wanna sort of get their grips on this, if you will. Um, so the Bitcoin ETF it was approved yesterday, Wednesday, January 10th, and it's uh, now changing things pretty rapidly. Let's just start from a big picture analysis. I guess, what's your sort of viewpoint on, on this from a advisor standpoint? Yeah, so as an advisor, this doesn't really affect my practice at all. So what I've tried to focus on for the last, I've been advising on Bitcoin basically since 2016. And what I've advised clients on is that we buy Bitcoin outright and we store it properly. And so to me, that's self-custody and that we do that either in a single SIG or a multi-SIG solution. And the single SIG or multi-SIG is going to wildly depend on the client's situation and what does or does not make sense for them. And so to me, the ETF, while it doesn't really necessarily affect my practice or how we're going to do things going forward. Obviously, it does affect the industry going forward and how financial advisors are going to be approaching this. Um, I think that if I'm, my hope is that it's a stepping stone. Um, my hope is that people allocate to Bitcoin um, through the ETF and that they use this as a stepping stone to realize that, hey, maybe I want to figure out how this technology works now that, you know, it's this you know, multi-billion dollar asset and so forth. And um, it's been around for 15 plus years and it's now an ETF. Um, and maybe this is something that's really worth more of my time. And so even though I've got this 1% or 2% allocation with my advisor, um, I'm now going to take it upon myself to buy Bitcoin outright and see how it works and so forth. And eventually I will be like all of Morgan's clients and take self-custody. That's my great hope. Um, I obviously, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm an optimist when it comes to thinking whether or not that will be what people actually do. I think that it's much more likely that most people get their assets parked in this ETF. They don't necessarily look at what it is or even think about having it in their portfolio. Um, they just see it as a diversifier that their advisor told them is prudent for whatever reason, and they don't even give it a second thought. 
Um, but there will be a percentage of people who do actually go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, so to speak. And that is beneficial, I think, because the more people who take self-sovereignty over their money, right, that's the whole point of this project, is that we start to remove these third parties, these trusted third parties, and we start to retake control of our money. Um, and then we have, you know, we're outside the purview of the government, you know, government surveillance and so forth on all of our transactions. Um, like, people have a right to that. Um, and this is not like conspiracy theories. Right? We obviously know that the government is looking at every single one of our transactions. Obviously, they're not, you know, yeah. honed in on what Mark Moss is specifically doing or what Morgan Richard is specifically doing. Right. But they could be if they wanted to be. And so I think just like it's un-American, obviously, and that for most people. Right. Even if they don't necessarily agree with like the libertarian utopia that we were talking about earlier, for most people, they still just want to live their lives and not be bothered by the government. And so um, I think that this adds to that project in a way that it's becoming more you know, institutionalize that this is something that's here and here to stay um, and that, you know, the government necessarily isn't going to attack it. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't help move it, move the project forward in the regard of people actually using Bitcoin the way it's meant to be used. Yeah. So it helps them uh, with their debasement of their savings, but doesn't really advance the project forward. I, I get messages all the time. I'm sure you do as well. I think I just yesterday I got one and someone asked me specifically, um, you know, I'm thinking about liquidating my entire 401k and paying a massive penalty and just putting the whole thing into Bitcoin. Do you think that's a good idea? Which, I mean, I can't really answer that question. But, um, but in this type of environment with an ETF, they don't necessarily have to do that, right? Yeah. So they don't have to liquidate their entire 401k and pay a penalty. They could just now move some of that into Bitcoin now because there's an ETF solution for that, right? Well, it depends, right? Because sometimes these 401k plans have specific investments that they're allowed to invest in. And so if the plan itself allows for Bitcoin investment, then obviously they could do that. If the plan doesn't, then they wouldn't be able to do that. They would still have to liquidate their 401k and pay the penalty and so forth. So I think it would depend on whether or not you're able to self-direct and so forth. Um, but there are, are a lot of those able to be are a lot of those able to be converted over into a into a self-directed 401k? Um, again, it's also going to depend on the plan and who is administrating the plan and so forth. So um, I'm sure like I've seen fidelity of plans where that's um, where it's, it's kind of open allocation or open architecture to to um, to allocate a certain percentage of your 401k, but not the whole thing to be self-directed. Um, other options that people have would be like if they separated from an employer to roll it over into an IRA and not take the penalty and then work with a company like Unchained Capital or so forth to set up. Uh, like a collaborative custody, multi-sig IRA and so forth. And obviously there are going to be fees associated with doing that, but then you're holding Bitcoin the right way. So there, the avenues are available, um, but the penalty would still apply just depending on whether or not the 401k itself is allowing for the ETF. Mm, okay. So just because there's an ETF doesn't mean that your 401k will have access to it. Um, yeah, definitely. To... And I would say, if anything, it will probably mean that people will not have access to it for a while because there are all sorts of rules and regulations that govern 401k plans. And um, most 401k providers are going to take a conservative approach to what they do and don't allow their participants to invest in. And a lot of the 401k stuff is managed. I mean, it's what we just talked about. So it's not self-managed, it's managed for you. So they're the ones that are sort of dividing that up and divvying that up and making your investments for you. So it's sort of like, I, I'm asking the question, but is it, is it, is it sort of like um, where that plan administrator at some point, and it might be years from now, would decide that he wants to bring Bitcoin into the allocation and then you get it that way? Well, so generally pensions work more like that where um, there are actually – uh, like a money manager that chooses the asset allocation based on um, actuarial assumptions about who is in the plan. Um, the 401k plans are what's called divine contribution. And so what the plan administrator does is they pick what people are allowed to invest in in the plan, but they don't pick the allocation. The person themselves, they decide um, like how much money they're going to put into the plan and then how they're actually going to invest the, that money. Generally, what the plan administrator does is they set some sort of allocation in one of these target date style funds that's based on your age and when they think you're going to retire and they force you into that. And then the onus is on the participant to go in there and actually change their asset allocation based on what other funds are available. Mm, okay. So maybe not a big influx from people that are already in these traditional vehicles, the 401ks, et cetera, because of different rules and regulations that are there. 
Yeah, I would say like the IRA crowd is going to benefit more because the IRA crowd, like they didn't want to take maybe their assets out of their IRA and pay the penalty or they didn't want to or they didn't know about a company like Unchained Capital or don't want to do something like that because it seems risky. And so they would benefit from the ETF for sure. And I mean, there's trillions of dollars in these IRA style yeah. uh, plans. So, I mean, yeah. the ETF yeah. will benefit from that. You told me before we started recording that uh, some of the Bitcoin financial planners um, were being, I don't know, investigated or coming after you, something like that. I don't know if you want to touch on that uh, briefly, but also, do you think that now with this sort of more institutional adoption with ETFs sort of takes some of that pressure off? Yeah, I kind of wonder. So the CFP Board of Enforcement, so I'm a member of CFP Board um, just because I have the CFP designation. Um, I've been a member since 2016. And um, we have a website called the Bitcoin Financial Advisors Network. Um, there's like seven or eight of us on there. And um, basically what we do is we help clients buy Bitcoin outright and take self-custody for the most part. Or um, we just work with clients who want to own Bitcoin in some capacity. And so prior to obviously the ETF being issued, right, this is not something that financial advisors could touch. And so we created this network to be just sort of a directory where people can find people like me who are very happy and willing to help people who are interested in Bitcoin. Um, the CFP board came, uh, found the website and decided for whatever reason that we may or may not be doing something that they agree with. Um, we actually don't have that in much information on what it is that they are suspecting is wrong about the network, other than the fact that we all advise on Bitcoin. And so they asked some questions that um, I felt personally were not uh, or beyond the scope of what was allowable for them to ask, like specific not specific client information, but um, like just kind of wondering about clients asset allocation and so forth and how they store Bitcoin in my practice and like what my role in that is. And so um, I responded very kind of tersely that, you know, this information is confidential. And so give me more information about what you're looking for. And maybe we'll give you more information type of a thing. Um, we all submitted our responses last week and uh, we're still waiting to hear back from the CFP board about what they're going to do with that information and what they're going to do with us. But um, so far, it's been a pretty poorly uh, done um, investigation, I would say, because they asked for publicly available information from a lot of us, um, and they also got my gender incorrect. So I, I thought that that was kind of funny that they didn't even go <laughs> on the website to see whether or not I was a man or a woman um, and just called me Mr. Rochard. So maybe they're actually after Pierre and not me. <laughs> Morgan, let's talk uh, sort of about this like uh, future vision that you have. So you talked about sort of like talking to your clients and you, you mentioned like how well do they understand the tech? That was kind of one of the things that you threw out, right? So depending on where you, um, how, how well you understand it and where you think it's going, then you can decide how you want to allocate. But I, if I think about this, uh, you know, I think you would agree Bitcoin is a commodity. So we value it like a commodity, not like an equity. So equities have cash flows and things like that. Um, so there's some sort of calculation intrinsic value, which that's a whole different topic, but a commodity is basically supply and demand driven, right? Uh, copper, right? Copper goes up when the economy is good. Copper goes down when the economy is bad, right? For example, right? Um, uranium, right? Uh, do we think nuclear is going to be bigger in the future or less in the future? And you sort of uh, play commodities like that. Um, so it's really driven off supply and demand. I don't really have to understand exactly how uranium is get got out of the ground and how it then powers nuclear reactors. So I don't really need to know the tech behind uranium. I just need to know if it's going to be in more supply and demand. So I'm curious, you know, how you've uh, how you think about now that we're a little bit further along now, especially with the ETF sort of maybe changing the paradigm or crossing the chasm, if you will. Um, do you talk about it more like a commodity and just like, hey, do you think the governments print more money in the future or less? <laughs> do you think governments are more authoritarian in the future or less from a supply demand aspect? Or do you still think it's important to like really get into the gr nitty gritty details of the tech? Yeah, so it's a great question, right? You don't have to like know everything about your car in order to start the ignition and be able to put gas in it, right? But you should know that you shouldn't put diesel in, in your car if it's not a diesel engine and so forth. And so, yeah, I mean, I think in regards to Bitcoin, it's the same thing. There are certain things that people are really going to have to know, uh, whether or not they need to know all the, the intricate details of mining and how nodes work and, you know, what mini scripts are. Obviously, I, I don't agree. I don't think people need to know that. What people do need to know, though, because it is so volatile, is why they're going to hold this. Because what you don't want to have happen, which has happened time and time again, is that people buy it at the absolute top, right? And then they can't hold through the cycle. 
Um, and so they're worse off, right, for buying it and then immediately selling, even if they had the long term goal of being able to hold this for 10 plus years because they don't actually need that money for 10 plus years. And so understanding the technology to me is, is actually similar to what you're talking about, right? Will governments be more or less authoritarian in the future? Like generally people think more so just given everything that's going on, right? Will right. governments continue to print money? Yeah, until we take their money printer away, right? They've shown time and time again that they're going to do that. And so you want to be able to opt out of the system in a way where there's less uncertainty with your savings. And so savings, the whole point of savings is that we minimize uncertainty. We don't minim we don't reduce risk, right? Because there are different risks that are measurable and so forth. But we do minimize uncertainty because there are different things that are going to happen in people's lives, whether they be good or bad. And you need savings in order to help in those situations, whether they are good or bad. And so Bitcoin is one of those things that, yeah, it can help with minimizing long term uncertainty. Um, but it can only do that if you're willing to hold it for a long period of time, in which case, again, you're going to have to make sure that you understand why you're holding it. Yeah. Let's talk about that holding for long periods of time. I, I've, I've said many times, like when people ask me, at, at what price will you sell your Bitcoin? And I'm like, well, you don't really understand how building wealth works because the goal is to get more assets. My goal is to get more assets and then pass those assets on to my kids, not to get more fiat. And so like I want to typically I think about assets in three categories, the best being uh, scarce assets. So fine art collectibles and waterfront property and Bitcoin, things like that, that can outpace inflation. And my goal is to get more of those things and not less. So like, why would I want to sell it? And so you talk about this long term perspective. Do you think about when you think about this long term perspective? Are you thinking like, I mean, is that what you would tell your clients? Like, hey, the goal is to get more assets, pass those assets down to your kids. Your balance sheet is your scorecard, uh, not selling them as a trader, trying to get more dollars in your bank account. Is that sort of how you think about that long term perspective? Yeah, so we like to frame the long-term perspective relative to what the client wants to do in the long term. So for most people, that's going to be living some kind of comfortable retirement. Maybe it means traveling. Maybe it means starting a business, right? There are all sorts of reasons why people need money in the future, whether it be today or 30 years from now. And so um, we like to frame how we're saving in those terms and making sure that we are presenting scenarios that are relative to what the client wants to do. So if, for instance, the client has a huge goal of legacy planning, right, where not only do they give to their kids, but they also give to certain charitable uh, organizations that are important to them, like how can we set those things up so that um, maybe the, the charitable organization can actually hold the Bitcoin and so forth, right? These are all kind of areas that we're, we're now planning into. And so setting it up as like, if you're, if, it, it's kind of like how they came up with that. I think it was like this app where you can actually make yourself look older so that it would force you to want to save because you're like, oh, I can yeah. see myself in the future. Um, while that app, I think, probably fizzled out, um, it does help people to actually kind of think about what they would be doing, even obviously if they change their mind. Um, but having more savings is going to provide f flexibility whether you know exactly what you're going to be doing in 30 years or not. And so um, being able to, to like put sort of the framework around what will that person specifically be doing in the future is going to ha help with that long term savings plan. And yeah, having more rather than less is generally going to be helpful. Um, I do think, though, that if Bitcoin does become a global reserve currency, we could potentially be in, in a situation where it, you know, inflation's not really the factor that we're looking at anymore. Um, and maybe we are in some sort of deflationary um, position where, you know, we're not trying to accumulate so much as just preserve. Um, but we don't live in that reality yet, right? So we're still yeah. in that accumulation, no matter kind of what stage of life you're in, even if you're in retirement, yeah, you still need to accumulate throughout retirement by not spending more than you can. Yeah. And I, I just think, uh, I, I love that you frame it up like savings. That's how I think about, I, th I, I try to not think about investing. I think about savings. So when I buy real estate, which I still buy, uh, sorry, Bitcoin guys, I know you hate that. I still buy real estate, uh, uh waterfront property. Uh, and, uh, but I think about my real estate and I think about my Bitcoin as savings. That's just, I'm just saving that. That's just where I put my money. Right. Um, I do, I think of some investing as more like some speculative stuff that I do. I do obviously the Bitcoin opportunity fund, you know, I'm investing in, in startups and VC stuff and stuff like that. So that's more of like my investment stuff, but yeah, real estate, Bitcoin, that's like long-term savings. Um, I know you're working on a new book and, uh, I know that's probably not coming out anytime soon, but I'm wondering if you want to give us a little sneak peek on that and, uh, kind of what your goal and intention is of that book. Yeah, so I wrote a book already called the Personal Finance Quick Start Guide, and it's really a fiat financial planning book with a very small sliver of Bitcoin in there. 
and um, got actually pretty good feedback from the Bitcoin community about the book, but them wanting more from a Bitcoin perspective and really me wanting to deliver more from a Bitcoin perspective. There isn't any book out there right now that's specifically about Bitcoin financial planning. There are a lot of books out there about why you should buy it and what it is and, you know, how it can help you in all sorts of aspects of your life and, you know, what's wrong with the money, right? You can go on and on. There's a list of so many Bitcoin books out there and there are a lot of very talented authors. So um, this is not a knock on any of these people, you know, I think of what everyone is contributing to the community is amazing. Um, but I do think that my role here, just given what I've seen, um, and like we basically in the last three, four years only have people coming through who have um, large Bitcoin positions. And so the the territory that I'm in right now um, and the financial planning problems that are coming up are not financial planning problems that people typically think of and are going to be financial planning problems that I think that a lot of people are going to have going forward. And so I would like to just tailor the fiat planning content to be more Bitcoin focused. And that's the whole heart of the book. Hmm. So it's not, uh, as you said, yeah, there's lots of great books out there. Uh, but it, but this one specifically is not to convince someone why they should buy Bitcoin or where Bitcoin goes in the future. But more specifically, if you're using it, here's how you may want to think about it through a larger sort of uh, you know view of your own financial future. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not here to orange pill anybody. People ask me that all the time. They're like, how do you orange pill? And I'm like, I really don't. I'm not here for that. What I'm here for yeah. is the people who are already orange pilled. How can we make this be very fulfilling and worthwhile and also like make it such that you actually achieve the goals that you set out to do, right? And so that's what the book is going to be about is like taking advantage of whatever fiat rules are out there to apply that and also making sure that Bitcoiners are actually asking themselves the high level questions that they need to ask about their personal financial situation. Yeah, love it. All right. Um, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Mark Moss Show. We've been sitting down with Morgan Richard. She's a financial planner with Origin Wealth Advisors and the host of the Bitcoin for Advisors podcast. We're going to link to all that in the show notes down below. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, the world's changing very fast. I think this Bitcoin ETF gets Bitcoin to cross the chasm. The early majority is about to flood in. So make sure you take a position, but do it responsibly. So listen to somebody smart like Morgan and don't go it on your own. But that's what we got. Thanks so much for listening today. Until next time. Thanks, Morgan. Thanks for having me.